check one two. Hello, can you hear me? I can. You sound great. Yeah. Yeah. I've been practicing. Sounding what? Sounding great. Just talking? Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever um, try to change your voice when you were a kid? Uh, like through surgery? No. No. Why? <laughs> <laughs> like to talk with a different voice? Yeah. Did you ever wish you had like an accent or? Not an accent, but probably I wish I. Something deeper. I don't know. Sometimes I hear myself. I'm like, do I have kind of like a little bit of a nasally whiny voice? I think I might. And I don't like that. I don't know. I want to have like a uh, strong Maximus voice. Maximus. Yeah. Yeah. So when I'm just like, hey, like, are you guys not entertained? It doesn't sound like that. It sounds right. like something epic. Yeah. And Ridley Scott. I feel like you could like, do a better job of. Ridley Scott's just going to be like, <laughs> we need to make a movie about this guy. <laughs> you seem genuinely inquisitive about their entertainment and i think yeah he was making a statement like he was just kind of being a punk but yeah. with me they'd actually feel like i'm i'm they like, feel you know what? give us a second let us talk about it this guy actually cares yeah about what he's doing i think your voice is fine oh just fine yeah thanks well i think it's bad <laughs> <laughs> it's look a, i'm not gonna lie it's not great it's but not, it's not uh, bad <laughs> well i mean uh who is that guy uh, uh russell crowe yeah. Yeah. He's got a voice, doesn't he? Yeah, Chris Hemsworth, uh, Thor. Oh, he's got a voice. Yeah, he's got... He's got a couple things. <laughs> Uh-oh. Glasses yeah. are coming off. <laughs> is it hot in here? I think you should submit a question to the podcast. <laughs> Jared, is there something you need to ask? <laughs> you you seem yeah. like you need clarity on yeah, some yeah, things. Yeah, your voice is fine. It's not, you. you know, it's no... Well, it's same. We've talked about this on the podcast. Have we? I think so. Okay. I think you exclaimed your love for Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly, I'm the one bringing him up, though. That's true. You seem to... It's the Australian accent. It's deep. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Just like deep as a kangaroo's uh, pouch. I don't know how deep that is. Well, it's big enough for a kangaroo to fit in. Have you seen a kangaroo Not with... full size. What? Full size kangaroo in, in full size kangaroo pouch? No, no, no. But no. have you seen a kangaroo with like a pretty... Like the kind of kangaroo baby that's getting kind of too big for the pouch, still hanging out in there. That can't be comfortable. No, I've never, I, I've never seen this. Is uh, this you happen upon this, or is you? No, I, I, <laughs> she was a lot of I didn't, I didn't stumble in the outback. <laughs> no, <laughs> crocky. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Are you, are you googling it? No, I was, I was wondering if we should. uh <laughs> What? What is it? We should do our Google search history. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you feel comfortable? <laughs> I don't know what mine is. Mine, uh, oh, it's probably related to cameras and... Let's, let's do it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> What's the very last thing you Google searched? C100 Mark I bit rates. <laughs> The second to last is the timeline on January thirteenth, nineteen ninety nine, in from the Serial Podcast. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's still it's still bumping around in my yeah. head. I've been listening to it this past mine week, is so, for like the third time. <laughs> mine is so forty year old. Oh no, forty three year old. <laughs> Best time to take blood pressure. <laughs> what? <laughs> Bought a blood pressure cuff. I've been teetering on high blood pressure. Oh really? Yeah, which is nuts. Um, well, it's because your heart is so strong; it's pumping too strong for your body to contain true. it. This is a problem. Uh, well, it's genetic, right? And yeah. so my family, um, you know, deals with it. And I do everything. If you go to the list of how to have low blood pressure, you know, things you can do, I do them all. Yeah. Um, so what kind, what kind of stuff do they say? You know, stay away from processed foods, yeah. exercise, low sodium. Yeah. Uh, get enough sleep. Yeah. You know, don't smoke, don't drink, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was wondering, you know, when is it? Cause I bought a, a blood pressure cuff to take it at home, you know, to monitor it. Cause I'm pre, I got this pre hypertension thing going. Interesting. Um, after that, uh, was, uh, does Tom Cruise really fly a jet plane in Top Gun? <laughs> because I watched uh, Top Gun Maverick last night. That's right. I did. Are you going to tell me about it? Yeah. I, I think it was good. Mm -hmm. And I would just say good. I have, I think part of the issue was, um, I felt like it was, uh, there was a lot of hype around it. And so by mm -hmm. the time I got to it, I had maybe bigger expectations. 
Uh, the hype ruins fantastic movies. It can. We so we decided to watch the original Top Gun mm-hmm. and then watch Top Gun Maverick. Yeah, like a couple days afterwards. Yeah. So Top Gun, the original Top Gun, was fresh. Mm-hmm. So here's part of the thing, and Rachel and I wound up having ourselves a a decent laugh last night about some of this, <laughs> because you watch Top Gun, the original. Yeah. You know, jet black hair, riding the motorcycle, racing the plane, uh, wearing the jacket. White T-shirt, jeans tucked in. You fast forward 36 years, and he has not progressed at all. It's true. Puts on the jacket, got the white T-shirt, wearing the same, has same jet black hair, all that. And I looked at it, and I started laughing, and I'm like, oh, oh, he might need to move on a little bit. <laughs> like, this is the first thing I'm thinking, because in any other place in life, like, this would be slightly unhealthy. Yeah. Um. He's like that guy that you go to high school with that can't let go of high school. Yeah. And I thought, oh. So he goes back and teaches at that high school. Right. Well, yeah. Not that there's anything necessarily wrong with that. Sure. But like 36 years later, he's still like, let's wear, put on the jacket. And I'm like, oh, he's got, and you know, it wound up being a kind of a, an interesting thing. So the first part of it for us uh, was a little, uh, felt a little cheesy. Which part was it? Or he's just, you know, and I understand it was nostalgia thrown back. Like, uh, oh, when he first like goes back to Top Gun. Yeah. When he gets in, when he gets in, I don't want to spoil it, but when he, when he gets in the one plane to test it out, Mm -hmm. you know, like, okay, this is cool. I will say that by the end of it, it had picked up a little bit, Mm -hmm. but there was nothing in that film that didn't feel like I had already seen that film. Mm, Really? The whole premise. At, at the end, spoiler alert, if you've not seen Top Gun Maverick, don't stop right now, and I will, if you're watching, I will do this when we're done talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, if you're not, you're just going to have to take the gamble. But the whole premise of flying through a canyon, and you've got something roughly the size of a wombat. Mm-hmm. It, it just felt like very Star Warsian to me. Like oh, I, for sure. I felt that. I've already seen that. It was, and I was like, oh, okay, it was good. Yeah, it was good. Uh, would I watch it again? I, I probably wouldn't. Like, mm. it would, probably wouldn't take two plus hours to watch it again. I wish I had seen it fresh, maybe in the theaters. Like some of the dogfighting stuff was was really you know mm-hmm. good. But the first part of it was just so cheesy and slightly. I felt bad for him. Like his credit card's getting denied. He's got no money. He's worth. Yeah, that was a little. That was like, a little weird, you know. But you've got a P fifty one access to a P fifty one, you know. That I'm assuming is your plane. That's probably worth a half a million. I don't know. I might have thought too deep into it. You might have. But, but I okay. just saw. I just saw. Um, you know, the original. I had just seen the original rather right mm-hmm. right beforehand, and then you fast forward, and now you've got nearly sixty year the sixty year old. Yeah, it's like you guys want to play football on the beach, yeah. <laughs> and then the credits. Everybody's in their flight suits, and then his, he's you know shirtless and just dripping with the oil. And I'm like, this is just I don't know. This just felt a little odd to me. Well, Tom Cruise had a lot of control in it, so well, and the, of course, right? Yeah, I've never met him personally. Um, well, so he I can't make a to, judgment uh, too much of a judgment call, but. Yeah, it was good. It was yeah. it was good. I'm glad I watched it. Yeah, like there were some really exciting parts, and um, you know, it was you know, he had some of that anticipation. Yeah. But the first part of it, I was just like, oh boy, this guy just yeah, still wearing that jacket, huh, bud? Well, I feel like that's <laughs> that part of the story is like this guy is still hung up on this thing that happened all those years ago, and now he's put in this similar situation with this guy's kid, and uh, well, and that's you just know, it. and so I think that's that might be intentional. Like part of it could just be chalked up to like, it's giving the people what they want. Tom Cruise. Put him back in his jacket, put him on the motorcycle. In 86, when that happened, he was, he was as cool as a cucumber, as the kids would say. And people like that. Hate cucumbers. Do you? Oh, I can't stand them. Even they're okay when they're, Ooh, I love pickles. Okay. But that's, that's like saying, well, you don't like caterpillars, but you like butterflies. What's up with that? I'm like, well, one is beautiful, the other one is, and I don't have anything against. So you believe that what happens? In fact, I think I like caterpillar. <laughs> in caterpillar the pickling process, is equal to metamorphosis. <laughs> it dissolves, but somehow maintains its memory. It's a mystery when science. The pickle jar opens and the cucumber flies out with all its salty goodness. <laughs> when it emerges from its <laughs> vinegar cocoon. As kids used to have those problems, you know, uh, cucumbers are to pickles as. 
in, I yeah. think butterflies is yeah that's your thing. To- so I think you're right. I think you're right. I think some of it was like, give the people what they want. Yeah, and that can always feel cheesy, right? Yeah, like, I feel like that sometimes. I don't want to be pandered to, right? And so there was an element of that that I was fighting against, but. Um, and maybe it was being in the theater where you like you could feel the, the planes. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it was yeah. just like I was sitting there, and I and I come to a movie a little bit differently than I used to because now I have all these like just like movie oh. credits. Yeah, I, it's it's like I'm thinking about what camera did they use and yeah. how did they you know? So I, as soon as we were in the theater and that scene opened up and it mirrors the first one where it starts with an aircraft carrier, and I'm just like, could you imagine getting to be on that camera crew? on that deck yeah, and feeling all that and yeah. hearing all oh, yeah. that. And, yeah. oh man, that, so I was yeah. just enthralled at the right. very beginning. I was just like, this is going to be the greatest night of my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it was um, good. It's definitely, I mean, it's, it's worth, it's worth watching yeah. you know, for the most part. It's a clean yeah, for clean sure. Movie. Yeah, um, it's not gonna, a couple it's, of things. It's probably not no. gonna go on a list of like, as far as, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> We're done with the spoilers. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think um, it's going to be like in, you know, top 50 list of greatest movies ever made. Yeah. But I just, for me, it was just, I don't know, just felt perfect. Yeah. Um, But it was also just fun, you know? Yeah. It was, it was a good, fun movie. Yeah. You know, where a lot of these like kind of action movies could just feel so stupid. Yeah. You know, it didn't, it didn't quite get to that level for me. I really enjoyed it. So, anyways, Needless to say, um, I've ordered a... A reissue of my Letterman's jacket from high school. Nice. And I'm going to start wearing my class ring. I wish you... Um, I was thinking about going back to long jet black hair. Should have gone with the mustache, too. I couldn't grow a mustache in high school. But but you could do it right now. I could. I see it. Just yeah. let it go. I freshly... Sh- not freshly shaved, but I... I, I noticed that. One millimeter today. That's what I did. Wow. I don't know what I'm doing. Don't care. It's just different. Every I shouldn't day say I don't you. care, because obviously I'm changing it, so I care to some You're degree. so reckless with your uh, hair. Hair appearance, yeah. Just well, for now, it all grows back. No intentionality, yeah. Yeah, some of it's just a boredom. Some mm-hmm. of it is, you know, heat related. Mm-hmm. And long hair was getting hot. Yeah, yeah. And some of it's just, you know, once in a while you just just want to do a change. Just need a change. That's a nice thing. Is like it's not as crazy as going out and getting a tattoo on your face. Yeah. Well. Yeah. You know. But yeah. I don't know why that's the only example I I went to. <laughs> A tattoo of a cucumber and a butterfly. <laughs> a cucumber morphing into it. <laughs> this is the strangest tattoo ever. Yeah. Oh boy. Henry loves pickles. Does he? Uh, doesn't like cucumbers. I love pickles. Can't. Stand He's like, cucumbers. what are what are pickles? I'm like, they're just pickles. Just eat it. Yeah. yeah if I say cucumbers, he'd be like, I knew it. I could taste it. Yeah. I like the little um, the little sweet ones. Uh, that's my worst. I, oh seriously? Yeah. You don't like those? I've been duped by those too many times. By oh no. Salad, by salad bars. How how? What do you mean? Yeah, they're just like pickles, right? You see yeah. it, and you get pickles, and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah this could be great. It's going to be a nice dill pickle. I grew up in dill pickles. No. I didn't grow up there on sweet, the, yeah. the bread and butter and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, bread and butter, the the thin slices, those are always a little too sweet for me. Yeah. I don't know why. There's got to be a balance to it. I like cucumber salad. Yeah. My, um, Sounds gross. Well, it's basically a bunch of cucumbers. I'll put tomato in mine. Uh, and Tomato's then, good. Yeah, you just thin slice of cucumbers, and yeah. then... A little bit of, uh, quite a bit of vinegar. Yeah. I just use white vinegar. You can use, you know. And by the time you go to take a bite, the vinegar is trying to to pickle. It's a pickle. (laughs) Nice. Uh, Maybe I would like that salad. (laughs) After 30 days when it's, when it's pickle salad. Oh, gross. Yeah. (laughs) That sounds disgusting. When I was younger, my sisters uh, would make dill pickle sandwiches. Mm. Just dill pickles? And a ton of uh, Hellman's. Yeah. Oh, that just made my stomach turn. Yeah. It's something. Cool. (laughs) <laughs> it was cool. Well, yeah, we could. What? But you were about to say something. Well, I was going to say uh, the one of the gro- my uh, grandma, uh, who's still alive, ninety five. When I was a kid, she's like, "Have you ever had a tomato and peanut butter sandwich?" And I said, "No." And I remember Ooh. eating it, and it wasn't awful. But then looking back now, I think I was being pranked. Yeah, yeah. Have I you to, ever asked I her about to, that? No. Oh. I used to sass her a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I was sassy as a kid. Like the cat from Homeward Bound. So I don't, I, I, I don't know if I've ever seen that <gasps> whole movie. Yeah. Have you seen parts of it? Yeah. Bits and pieces. Oh, okay. Well, there you yeah. go. We just watched it with the kids. Uh, 
uh, not too long ago, and it was a delightful experience. We've tried to get Henry to watch it. He, he, there's no movie yeah. he's going to sit down and watch. Yeah. yeah. He's too energetic. Very much so. Yeah. We went out to the U.S. Uh, director for Missions of Hope International, which is um, what one of the major international ministries that we support here at Hope was. Yeah. In uh, Pennsylvania, and so she was, she was kind enough to, and she desired to, you know, kind of drive over. And her and Bob have been talking for a couple of years, yeah, over Zoom. And she's where we get all of our information and updates. Mm-hmm. Um, but she was in town, so we wound up going to uh, out to lunch afterwards with her. And she was like, "I met your son. I saw your son." And she's like, "Well, he's high energy." <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes, yes, we know. Very, very high energy. He's got a lot of a lot of energy. Funny. Yeah, we went to Don Ramon. Yeah, and ate a pile of Mexican. Lots of people stew. around here enjoy that. Yeah, you like that kind of food or no? Yeah, I do. do yeah, we've talked about it. Yeah, I feel like I'm being pranked by every Mexican restaurant. That's right. No matter what That's I right. order, yeah, they're yeah. just like, "Hey, yeah. give him the same thing you ordered last time." Yeah, he wasn't even here last time. Well, we know what he ordered at every other Mexican <laughs> we're, restaurant because we're, we're all on a team trying to prank Jared. We're getting to the point in the podcast where we're starting to repeat ourselves. I think we are. We're, we're running out of personality to share. <laughs> I don't know if we had any. Shut it down before. <laughs> Shut it down before we run How out. How long did they make it? I think episode 31 was it. It was the ninth time they talked about Mexican food. That was food. the finale. <laughs> Wait a second. Here's one. One time I was Batman <laughs> in a rubber suit. Is that the one where you saw the Joker? <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. That's the one. Tell us let, about the Russian. Let me start from the beginning. <laughs> Tell us about the Cold War Russian. As a young man, <laughs> we should greet. We should. Welcome to the Atrium, a Hope Christian Church podcast. I'm Jared, creative arts pastor here at Hope Christian Church, and you are... And I am Neil. How oh, you are. And I'm a lead pastor here at Hope Christian Church, and this is episode number... 31. 31. We're creeping up on my age. Yeah. Well, you are 31, right? 31 and a half? Something like that. So at episode you, you three, do, 31 and a half. You do half <laughs> sizes when you're in a grown-up. Hang on a second. Hang on. It's like something that kisses. How old are you, 70s? I'm seven and three quarters. Hang on. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> Yeah. I am 377 months old. Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> no. Yeah. Love those parents. Where do you shop? <laughs> for what? <laughs> for what? <laughs> what am I shopping for? Ask. Give me an example. I didn't of want to talk about what you were talking about anymore. So <laughs> just, <laughs> shit, where do you shop? <laughs> oh. I went up to... Uh, one of the guitar players at church, Jose. Yeah. Um, he and I, he might be the only person on the planet that has similar musical taste that, that I do. He freaks. That's an ex- exaggeration, but he likes a lot of crazy guitar stuff. And yeah. so I walked up to him a couple weeks back and I was, and I was like, give me your phone number. There's stuff I want to send you throughout the week sometime. And he looked at me, he's like, is that how you got Rachel? <laughs> he said, that was so forceful. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so powerful. Right. I was wow. like, well, you can give it to me or I can get it from Planning Center. It's one or the other. Which turns out, <laughs> Planning threat. Center didn't so have it. So I told you, I was like, give me Jose's number. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He was like, no, please send me send me the stuff. Interesting. So where do you shop? <laughs> For what? <laughs> Just in general? I, when you when I say shop, you think what? Man, I don't know. This Co- is a call Costco, and response cheer that I used to do. Costco, Home Depot. You think food, shopping for food, shopping for clothes, shopping oh, for Oh, like Target. Pickles. I like Target clothes. Yeah. You're middle of the road where it's you don't feel like you're breaking the bank, but you're still yeah. getting something that looks decent. Yeah. Um, but kids' shoes, man. We, I mean, I, I don't know why growing up it just felt like Walmart was just, you don't do that because it's just like, unless you're... For kids' shoes? I, I don't know. Like clothes-wise and stuff, you're just not sure. Like quality-wise. But boy, we've just started like... Where's the cheapest place we can go for shoes? Because they grow out of them so yeah, quick. Yeah, man. Yeah. Holy cow. It's yeah. just not worth I spending get a bunch from of money. Walmart. It depends on what it is. Um, stuff has held up great. Yeah. Yeah. I've got, I, I, over the years, I've gotten stuff there. All my horse riding clothes come from Walmart. Is Did that you, where you got your saddle? Yeah. And you know the toll that that takes on well, sure. clothing yeah. at the speeds that I normally ride horse. Yeah. 600 miles an hour. It's knots. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is that 600 knots? I, I still don't understand. Why not? I don't know. Why Why, <laughs> why is it like... Why not? <laughs> why not? Why? I had an like, old Italian grandpa that Are you off the ground? Uh, well, I'm in the air. Not. <laughs> you want spaghetti? No. Why not? <laughs> I guess it's breakfast. Okay. And then they're like, Papa. are you are you still on the ground? Well, yeah, I'm kind of on the ground, but I'm also in the water. Not. I yeah, I don't stupid. know. 
Anyways, I don't know what that is. There's some science person out there who's like screaming. Yeah, saying, probably. I know the answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, kids' clothing. Yeah. We we go all over the place. The nice thing is, is we've we've received so many like yeah secondhand clothes over the years. Did you and, keep some of Judah's stuff for? Oh yeah. Um, mm-hmm. What are we calling the new child? What do you guys call him at home? I call him number that, three that guy <laughs> in there. I we, yeah. we 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 cannot decide. Yeah. It's it's tough. Mm. I I don't know. Yeah. Now we're like. Digging around the bottom of the barrel, I'm like, do we like Ezra? <clears throat> like, nope. Yeah. What about Cecil? Nope. Cecil. That wasn't a serious question. That's too old timey. It feels like Cecil. Yeah, it feels like. A... Have you ever met a real mm-hmm. Cecil? Have you really? Actually, this was a kid my age in Sunday school when I was growing really? up. Really? Yeah, his name yeah. was Cecil, and I was just like, man, that sounds like an old man. But yeah. I didn't say that. That I remember. I don't know. Yeah. That's the same day that someone was like, "There's not a book of David in the Bible," and dumb old me was like, eh, "It seems like there would be." Yeah. Yeah. So it tells you how smart I was when I was little. Yeah. yeah. I hope I progressed since then. I would think then so. Because then I was really dumb. Well, you're 377 months old now. Yeah. That's a lot of months. Yeah. Back then I was only, <clears throat> I don't know, 130 months. I wonder how many months I am. Probably a million. I would, I feel, I don't feel quite like a million. Yeah. But I do feel like 516. Do you? Yeah. Who be that? Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, we bought Henry's shoes two months ago, three months ago, maybe. Yeah. Grew, grew out of them. Toes just, it's you know, crazy. He, he's just shooting up like a weed. I found that <clears throat> Judah's feet are not just growing quickly, but they're also just kind of, he has fat feet. Like they're wide. Well, he's I don't tiny. mean that as a dig. Well, yeah, no. I guess he's, he's not even quite two yet. No. That's he's pretty a, normal. No, yeah. They have to carry a certain amount of fat. Yeah. You know, in their body. Yeah. Henry was just a little baby snowman for a while. Oh, was he? Oh, my. Yeah. His wrists looked painful. Looked like a pack of hot dogs. Oof. Yeah, we we were looking back at pictures when we, actually, when we moved here last year, Judah was enormous around then. I forget about that, but I remember someone, one of the people who came over when we were moving in Texas to help us kind of pack up the truck and stuff. Yeah. He saw Judah for the, like, and he had never met Judah before. He's like, oh, man, he's a tank. I'm like... That's a nice way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> I remember. Not like, he's an enormous blob. Our pediatrician uh, was talking to us, and we were trying to figure out, like, you know, he's always up and always hungry, and, you know, does he need, should we be waking him up to eat at night? And, and he's like, no, let him sleep. He's like, yeah. your, your, your baby's not small. Mm-hmm. And we were like, oh, <laughs> okay. He's like, you don't understand. He doesn't need the food. <laughs> right. Yeah. Are you hearing me? Let him sleep it off. <laughs> Nemeth's. Nemeth's. <laughs> so... Anyways, yeah. So we, I mean, we shop all over the place. For, yeah. It just depends on what it is. That's a good question, though. Like Home Depot or Lowe's? <clears throat> it depends on what I'm getting. Yeah? Yeah, it really does. Really? So Home Depot is closer to the house. Yeah. Uh, but there's certain things that, so I find I prefer some of the styles available at Lowe's uh, rather than Home Depot, some of the brands that they carry at Lowe's yeah. for certain like things. Like hardware, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, lighting, yeah. uh, blinds, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I need a hammer, going to Lowe's. Really? No, going no. to Home Depot. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. interesting. Going, yeah. Probably. Well, some people are just like, never buy tools at, at you know, Home Depot. I only go to Lowe's. You know, some people are either or. I try to get my tools from Target. Like, I don't need that many tools. I need that thing that is pre- <laughs> It, it folds. It's a, it's bifold. It's yeah, plastic. It's the you case open with it up. All, everything case. in it. Just give me a tool case. It honestly is really <clears> handy. <throat> like so, unless you're doing like some heavy impact stuff where you're just gonna Which bust some stuff. Yeah. It's like I I'm kind of the same way. Unless I need a specialized tool, but then it's just like I don't want to spend money on this specialized tool that I'm gonna use once. Tools are very expensive. Yeah. I so put it, in... it makes sense. Like if you're a contractor doing the same kind of work all the time, it makes sense why you you pour a bunch of money into having the very best that it's gonna help you do the very best that you can do. But if you're just <clears> me. Needing to do one thing once, yeah. Like I don't know. I have the appropriate amount of tools for my skill set. There you go. And yeah. if I have to get any tool beyond what I have now, I'm mm-hmm. I'm in territory where I don't have the skill. Mm. It's going to wind up costing me more for somebody to fix yeah. what I have thought I could do. Mm. So if I look at it and I'm like, "Boy, you need this uh, impact wrench," I don't have that. Yeah. And then I go, "But why don't you have it?" Mm. Because you don't need it because you don't have that skill. Mm. This is why I have zero harps at my house. You don't have any harps? Not a one. I thought you had one. Got rid of it. Yeah. Bought an impact wrench. 
Yeah. No. Could have an impact harp. I find harps to be very nice to look at. <laughs> they are nice to look yeah. at. It's amazing Boy, seeing someone who can actually, too. yeah, who can actually play one. Yeah. We were in, this is one of my trip in Australia. We came across this guy in the back country who, who made harps, um, by hand. And, uh, yeah, they were expensive. It's cool yeah. though. So anyways, so who I, is texting me. I know I'm blowing up over here too. <sighs> Those, is it your wife? No, part of it is Instagram. Is it? I'm getting blasted on Instagram. <laughs> Can you teach me how? Because like, <laughs> it seems so unfair. So I've been off Instagram for six months. Oddly enough, we've got a social media question uh, this week that we'll get to in yeah. a little bit. Um, but I have this uh, I'll love hate thing with social media yeah. uh, where I'll be on for a little bit and then I, I always take breaks. Mm -hmm. And it used to be that I could deactivate my account and then just restart the account. Yeah. But that is no longer the thing. So if you're off longer than 30 days, they delete your account. Interesting. Apparently. Unless I hit the wrong button, which is possible because I'm 512 months old. So I got off Instagram, I don't know, six months ago or whatever it was. And Rachel and I were out, you know, in the gazebo hanging out and she showed me all this stuff on Instagram reels and all this. And I was like, you know what, that I'd, I'd like to get back on. I miss, I follow guitar players and workout stuff. Yeah. It's pretty much in foods, some food stuff and some car stuff. Yeah. Those are my main interests <laughs> outside Guitars, of right, food, cars. Right. I don't get my theology from Instagram. <laughs> oh, you don't? I don't. So I don't fall. So my degree is actually, I made that up. Did you? I just figure it's equivalent of what I've learned all on TikTok. So perhaps. <laughs> We'll see. We'll see how the day goes. Oh, um, no. <laughs> so I get back on Instagram uh, last week, maybe a week before, whatever it was. And it, it keeps, you know, hey, you haven't posted anything yet. And so Rachel showed me all these reels. And I'm like, oh, I'll post a reel. And I've got this reel of my son, Henry, and I uh, playing music together. Henry's five and he's got a full size drum kit and a, a decent amount of skill. And we're playing this uh, Mammoth WVH song, which is Eddie Van Halen's kid. And uh, it's a song called Bo Don't Back Down. And it's got this, you know, drop D guitar riff. Da, 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 and, it, and it's got this, you know, kind of cool beginning drum intro. So I throw it on there. Five minutes goes by and my phone just starts blowing up like crazy. It had hit some type of, I don't even know, a viral pocket or wave. I don't, I don't know why it happened, but I, I looked at it and it had um, like 26,000 views. <laughs> on it it within like maybe eight minutes not yeah. very long in like 400 likes and then it took a couple of days off and then um starting up last night again it's i'm not doing anything it's just started to do its thing again so right now it's up to thirty thousand four hundred views so it's gotten another six thousand plus views today and 581 likes so <laughs> I don't know what's happening. So I should probably nice. just turn the notifications off on, on the Instagram, but it's like, maybe, Hey, Rick, 2233 like this. <laughs> Thanks like, Rick. I was like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So wow. needless to that's say, cool. yeah, that's what, what's going on with my phone. Yeah. So I, I would like to do the, um, meet and greet question. Really? Today. Yeah. Okay. I was having a conversation with the fellas uh, a few minutes ago Yeah. over the lunch. Yeah. And I thought this might be interesting. Okay. So I would like to present the meet and greet question if you're okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. Let, let, why don't we go ahead and... Um, we can do the standard introduction. Good. That's the way it should be. Are you ready? <laughs> you know. I've noticed I've yeah. gone back to the... Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. It's weird. This is just loosen up, man. It's just Noodle arm it. Noodle arm? Yeah, noodle arms. It's time for our favorite segment. <laughs> Meet and greet. Ba -da -ba -ba. I can't believe we just... <laughs> We're losing it. <laughs> Episode, Episode 31. 31. <laughs> We've hit our 30s. Now oh. we're in our early 30s. We're starting to get so confident with ourselves that we just don't really care what people think. We're going to make just more and more bad decisions. I think that's what it is. Okay. So, so here's my question it? for you. I was hanging out uh, with the fellas. <laughs> uh, Are we in the mafia? <laughs> yeah. You don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> So I was hanging out with uh, Chad, uh -huh. Mark, uh -huh. Zach. Yep. That's all. Uh, Bob went home to eat tilapia. and <laughs> That sounds like a very Bob thing to do. It is. It is. <laughs> um, What's the question? And I, 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 I thought it would be interesting, and I asked the guys and got some of their answers. 
But when you were a kid mm -hmm. and you had your own room, what did you have on your walls? Great question. And did it change from, let's say, if you can remember any parts of being, you know, mm -hmm. younger, five, mm -hmm. six, seven, to mm -hmm. preteen, to teen, yeah. to adult, to what do you have on your walls now? That's good. Uh, great question. So my earliest memory was a shared room. I shared bunk beds with my older sister. So she was on the bottom, I at the top. And this is when we were very young. Yeah. And uh, I just remember our room was a mess all the time. Yeah. Like I look back and I'm just like, it stresses me out. Yeah. Because Sarah and I are pretty clean. Like not, not like neurotic about it, but yeah. Like, yeah. So then when we moved, um, I don't know that I had anything on my walls. Like I think there were some knickknacks on my, on my dresser, like kind of stuff like that. But it would have been stuff my mom put there. I didn't. Okay. You know, I was yeah. still like five. Okay. And then when we moved into the house, I kind of, you know, we were in for up until I left home. Um. So I kind of grew up there. Uh, when we first got there, I have no memory of any decor. And then, I went away to Tennessee for a couple of weeks to hang out with my grandpa. And when I came home, my parents had surprised me by decorating my room as like an underwater theme. Oh, wow. It was awesome. Yeah. Like it was really good. So you so were a was, fan of underwater? No, not particularly, but it was just cool, you know? So, so they just took a gamble and it paid they off. They just went for it and it was awesome. So they, they painted the walls. They wow. had a uh, undersea wallpaper halfway up with a uh, cool border yeah. um, uh, midway. And then they, like, I remember, like, up over my bed, they had, like, put a net with, like, all these sea creatures in it. Well, they it was, went it was all kinda, out. Yeah, it was awesome. Like, a and couple up, starfish. And up to that point, you had never expressed an interest in anything nautical. No, like, I liked sea creatures. It's cool, you know. It, but it was never like I was, like, I was never, like, I'm going to be a oceanographer or something like that. I, just, I yeah, so it, it was kind of just a guess on their part, but I I loved it. I thought yeah. it was so cool. There were a couple like under underwater pictures and stuff on the wall. It was cool. So yeah. anyway, so it was like that for a couple of years, um, and then they had I don't know how long it was like that, um, but eventually that changed, and I think it was just some of that stuff got pulled down, like the nets and stuff. When I was yeah. a little bit older, I don't remember if I did it or if my parents did it, but. Uh, yeah, I just, I never really did decorating. And then eventually there was this office downstairs that I got stuck in when they had a baby. And when I was 14, they had my little brother. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I moved downstairs, I believe, I'm trying to remember, but I think that's what happened. No, no, no. I was, I was upstairs still. But I, I never, I never so you decorated. you never had like a poster that you taped to the wall? Maybe I had like Lego thing. Maybe when I was I, uh, <laughs> what when is I was Lego like, thing? <laughs> no, a Lego thing. Lego thing. <laughs> My summoning it. <laughs> no, a Lego thing. Maybe I did just say Lego thing. <laughs> well, I had a picture of Lego thing. <laughs> what is Lego thing? No, oh, you haven't heard. <laughs> Bow before Lego thing. <laughs> He knows all. <laughs> he builds all. <laughs> he is king of brick. Um. No, I loved Legos, and so I, I obviously was <laughs> a... Uh, I can't get over Lego things. Give me a second. <laughs> I was a subscriber to Lego Magazine, and every once in a while they had like a little pullout. You know, they'd have a pullout poster. <laughs> you need to calm down. I can't shut off what's happening in my head. Just give me a second. Why don't you, just, why don't you just go ahead and share what you're doing? <laughs> just got to get it all out. <laughs> Oh man! Is that the noise that Lego? I've, 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 I have literally in in fifteen seconds written a whole movie script called Lego Thing. So is just, it a horror film? Like what is oh, it? This is dominoes in the brain like oh. mine. I just can't stop it. Whew, okay, uh, I'm good. Okay, what's the what's the movie about? Oh no, we don't have time. For this. <laughs> we got to talk about God stuff. Oh boy. Anyway, so I might have had like Lego posters yeah, or something yeah. at one point i don't know but i've never been big on decorating like sarah it took 10 years for me to hang pictures up in okay. our home yeah and it's not because i don't appreciate them it's just that i'm like eh, yeah. i don't know so you're never like man i love this a uh, sports star or this this band i love audio adrenaline <laughs> <laughs> stephen curtis chapman stephen curtis chapman <laughs> no no 
Nope, never. Yeah, that wasn't my thing. I don't know. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I just didn't didn't. It never occurred to me to like decorate. Yeah. I don't know. I love that your folks just were like, he's going under the sea. That's what we're doing. It was awesome too. Your dad. It's like, not that I don't appreciate. Decorating. I like Jacques Cousteau. <laughs> he's gonna like Jacques Cousteau. Or he can get out of this house. Uh, that's like uh, who's the who's the guy? Um, oh, never mind. It doesn't even matter. So, anyways, yeah. <laughs> what well, <that> fizzled quickly? <laughs> I I realize I'm I'm trying to get quick at recognizing when I'm not going to remember the pertinent information. Okay. But sometimes I'll start talking <laughs> about it before like. It's like you go to court, but you don't have your case organized yet. Okay. It's like, I don't have an argument yet. I shouldn't yeah. have started this. That's how it feels sometimes. So I just have to like shut that down before continuing on. So the hope is that eventually it won't ever get started. Yeah, just exactly. Shut the story down. It's like, I just need to yeah. recognize from the get go that I, I can't remember <laughs> I all that. I have nothing to offer. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways. Okay. That's a great question. Thanks. That's really good. Do you care if I ask a question? I would love Which, that. Please. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because of my answer to the last one. If... If you you had, had live under the sea. No, no, no. no. Oh. Listen, if you had to choose, and I get that they're, they're okay. Just imagine you you have to choose between okay. going to space or going under like into the ocean. Which one do you choose? Like, imagine you have to take a like a week long trip into either. I'm one. going to space. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Talk about that for a little bit for me. <clears throat> Why space? Well, it is the final frontier. It is. Uh, so to go in the water, I'm assuming that I would have to dive to some depth. Sure. And I just feel like it's going to be real dark. Mm -hmm. And the idea of being in a small space, thousands, maybe you know, what's the ocean get? 20,000, 25,000 feet deep. 20,000 like leagues. 20,000. Right. what they say. Right. <laughs> Jules Verne anyway said that. He did. So that the idea of being in some, you know, tube mm -hmm. that's under the water mm -hmm. to see like a green octopus or yeah. something, this isn't appealing It'd to me. It'd probably be a translucent glowing octopus at that point. Something. Something where everything is inside and its yeah. skin is completely see-through. Yeah. You know, you've exactly. seen that fish with like the eyes that are like in its. Oh its yeah, yeah. And it's just a, a, yep. that transparent or translucent film. Yeah. Um, you know, stuff that when you take it out from that depth, it's just a giant blob. But you put it down there, and it's like this beautiful thing. Oh yeah, for sure. I don't care. I don't. I don't want to be in the ocean. Yeah. yeah I have no need. It's they, they got whatever they got going on. I'm fine with it. Mm -hmm. I don't need to figure it out. Yeah. I can't help it all. I don't even really care to see it. Yeah. Um. Space, on the other hand, uh, also terrifying mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. I have zero desire to go up there. Mm -hmm. But it would be neat to experience uh, um, no gravity. Mm -hmm. I'd like to float. Yeah. And I also, it would be neat to um, see Earth from a different perspective. Yeah. I think that seems more appealing to me. Um, you know, there's... Uh, Nothing's going to crush you necessarily, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, obviously, you know, um, pressure could crush you, you yeah. know, in, in the ocean. And if there's a leak in the, you know, your spaceship or whatever, you could, you know, oxygen and all that. But then you put a mask on, and, you know, and that whole thing. So space seems like the less terrifying of the two. Yeah. To me, if I had to choose. It's interesting. Um, but if I didn't, I if I had the opportunity to go one or the other, I would just stay in Avon. Yeah. Yeah. I don't need to. So they're like, you can either go in the ocean, go to space, or go to Avon, Ohio. Yeah. I'm going to Avon, Ohio. Huh. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I just have no, I don't know. Yeah. I, I just, I, you know, it'd be fun to see some of this stuff. Yeah. But I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> 512 months old. You know, I got Fantastic. scripts to write. Like, it's just, I'm busy. Yeah. You know. You are busy. Yeah. So that's, that's how it Too is. Too busy crafting Lego thing. Lego thing. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. That's my answer, I think. Mm. It's intriguing. I, I would ask you, but I, I already thought, know the answer. Like, to me, there is no... But there are reasons. Oh, boy. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you know oh, me boy. so well. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> don't grumble. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm just... Don't grumble at me. <clears throat> um, no, I, I literally, like, I was just thinking, okay, 
if I go in the ocean, the water is trying to kill me. Yeah. Like, I can't live in the ocean. Like, it's going to kill me. But if I go in space, space is trying to kill me too. But what's the difference between the two? There are things living in the ocean that want to kill me too. It's not just the water. It's not the environment that I'd be in. Yeah. It, it's the, the, the things that live there too that are trying to kill me. If yeah. I go to space, no one's out there trying to kill me. Yeah. Except for maybe the other astronaut. See, I assume you're somewhat shielded from some of that. In, uh, in the ocean? Well, you're just, you're in a tube. You're not down there scuba diving. Well, sure. But yeah. still, it's like, I don't know what's down there. You know, we've Me only. Megalodon? We've, <laughs> who knows? We've right. only explored what? Like, um, like none of the ocean. So I don't, yeah. I don't know what the exact percentage is. It's surprisingly high of what we do not know about the ocean. Yeah. There is, and oh, I can't big. remember what year this was, but you know how they'll put trackers on different species of animals just to study them and yeah. see their movements and their migrations and stuff. So there is this female great white shark off the coast of Australia, I believe. And not only can they track like where they're at, but depth and stuff just to figure out their <laughs> migration and patterns and everything like that. So they put this tracker on this, this great white shark and they're, tracking her and like cool let's see what she does and so they track um i think it's that one day the tracker goes missing or something like that yeah boy i i could be i could be messing this up yeah so it, i'm gonna go with the tracker goes missing let's start this they, rumor yeah let's not do this let's start it i'm gonna go with they're tracking it from afar because i'm assuming if they had to recover a tracker there's no way they'd find it in the ocean yeah so let's do this <clears throat> i think it's this they're tracking her and at one point, she dives to an incredible depth at a speed that it's impossible for a great white shark to dive to. Yeah. So something either grabbed or pulled this giant shark down to the depths of the ocean, and they never... They, they don't know what happened to her. We interrupt this broadcast to issue a correction regarding the mystery of the missing shark. It was a nine-foot great white shark whose black box washed upon our shore four months after placement. Researchers found that the shark's temperature had rapidly increased by nearly 65 degrees and sharply descended almost 2,000 feet. They later found that the disappearance of their shark coincided with the migratory patterns of a larger 16-foot great white shark that had recently entered the area and concluded that it was a case of shark-on-shark -shark cannibalism. How dreadful! What a beast! We apologize for the misleading information and assure you corrective steps have been taken to ensure similar mistakes do not happen in the future. In fact, Jared offers his deepest and most sincere apology. Here is his statement. I state my regret. My oh my, such sincerity. Thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the show. So it's stuff like that that just, and I think that's true. Maybe maybe someone's listening to him like, that was debunked. And maybe that's true. I don't know. I, I think it's yeah. true though. And it sounds real. So yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to go with it. Yeah. And it's stuff like that that just makes me feel like I don't need to go in the ocean. Yeah. You know what? There's no reason anyone needs to go in the ocean. Yeah. There's no reasonable explanation for why anyone wants to go in the ocean, except for maybe like I could see scuba diving at like Great Barrier Reef or uh, I want to go see the Titanic or something yeah. like that. Like that'd be cool. But well, and surfing. People like surfing. You don't have to. There's other things to do. But, but people like it. Yeah. Can't. Can't they can they can like it if they want. Yeah, I still think they don't need to be doing that. I tried doing that uh, surfing at uh, Calhari. Calhari yeah. yeah, just this something else. Did it destroy you? It did. Yeah, I didn't do very well. I don't even know it's how tricky you there because you can lose clothing. Like boy, yes. I'll tell you. Yes. Like I had to grab my britches a couple times because I'm like, if you're standing in line, you might get a show. <laughs> yeah, boy, I, I shut this thing down. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's just ripping people's clothes off. Like it's highly um, inappropriate. It is, yeah, yeah I, it beat me up pretty good. Every time I've tried that thing, I just I've never been able to actually stand up. I get out there on my knees, and I'm like, this yeah. is stupid. Like, I, how do you get to the point where you can stand up on this thing? I don't. There's, it's like there's no reasonable stepping stones to being able to do this. You can either start at this level or you're not at all. And if you can't, you get what so, I'm saying? Yeah, somewhere there has to be some progression, but I, I think it just takes time. Yeah, maybe it does. I yeah. don't know. So anyways, yeah, it's always interesting. So space for me. Space. For well, lots of reasons, so. not, not too surprising there. I know. So let's talk about Sunday. So what? <clears throat> what's that? 
I said let's. Oh, yes. <laughs> I thought you said less. Lego thing. I was like, you're, you calling me less? No. <laughs> yes, Lester. All right, Lester. <laughs> and from here on out, I'll be known as Cecil. <laughs> Welcome Our back to Cecil names. and Lester. <laughs> So podcast. Sunday was uh, week four yeah. of our Psalm Sermon series, and what we do in this series, we've been kind of, you know, taking a, a look at these categories of Psalms. Mm-hmm. Week one was a kind of a bird's eye view of Psalms, and then we established a theme. What is the common theme? And there's several themes in Psalms, but let's take a look at this theme of praising God on all occasions. And then we went to Psalms of Lament in week two, and how do we lament well? Mm-hmm. Uh, week three was Thanksgiving difference between, uh, you know, being grateful and thankful and Thanksgiving be the expression of gratitude. And then uh, this past week, we talked about Psalms of enthronement. And when I was looking at enthronement, some of these are, when you look at some of these categories of Psalms, there's this part of me that when I was putting the series together, I'm like, boy, how are you going to really make this, you know, fit Mm. um, into relevant culture, a culture that we don't, I have a king. Yeah. We've got a leader. We've got a president. And boy, how much do we respect our president these days? And this is not a political statement on one side or the other from me. It's the reality yeah. is that overall, people don't respect, don't honor their leaders. Yeah. They just don't. If they don't like what somebody is doing, if they don't like what they they are saying, whether or not it's... Um, Right or wrong is often not even a question. Yeah. It's a matter of preference. It's a matter of opinion. I would prefer it that they do it this way. I opened this up in relationship to elders in the church a few weeks back and talked about submitting to authorities, you know, that section of Hebrews, you know, you Romans 13, you know, all these things. And so I'm looking at Psalms of Enthronement, and the language is coming from a period of time where there were still kings. And there was loyalty, and there was respect, and there was honor, and there was that imagery being used, or that imagery was being used, that picture was being uh, built by these psalmists in these, uh, you know, psalms of enthronement yeah. as a as a means to somehow make our understanding of God a little bit more easy. We know what a king is. We still, even knowing what a king was on this earth, don't understand just how kingly God is yeah. because he's completely separate. He's completely holy. He, he, we, we don't, he's, compl- he's all powerful. He truly has sovereignty. And so I'm looking at this, you know, over the last, when I put the series together, a while back, and then as I'm, you know, crafting it over the last several months, going, how in the world do you make this fit? And so after just spending time looking at it, it kind of dawned on me that, you know, kings ruled. That's what they, that's what they did. And that every single one of us has something that rules us. And the hope and the desire is that it is God ruling us, his word ruling us, his spirit ruling us. But that's not the reality for the majority of us, is that there's incidental rule, there's occasional rule. And the times when you look back on your relationship with God and you're like, man, we're so close, were the times that you were allowing him to rule you the most. You were obedient to his word, and there was a closeness Mm. uh, that was being experienced from that. And so I wanted to start to create this language and take the church through a visual exercise at the end of the sermon of dethroning whatever it is they've put on, and I'm air quoting, the, their throne, the throne of their yeah. life. Because the reality is is that God is on the throne. He's always on the throne. We're not really putting anything on an actual throne. What we're doing is we're making idols. That's what we're doing. And so we're idolizing something, but I wanted to keep that language somewhat similar. So I, I wanted to take the church through this idea of dethroning whatever it is they put on the throne. And then I gave a bunch of examples of, you know, how your job can be king, uh, your finances can be king, your kids can be king, your your uh, vanity, your pride, your sin, um, you know, your diet, extra, anything can be king. And, yeah. and we wake up every day. And, there, and the other reality is, is that not every single day is the same for the majority of us. Mm-hmm. And so different things are taking the throne or we're, we're seating upon, we're enthroning things uh, every single day. 
And then the challenge of the church was let's go ahead and be intentional and remove. And I made the point that it, throughout history, the majority of kings found their way on the throne either through succession. They were the heir. There, somebody died, and yeah. so now they're now they're in charge, yeah. or it was taken by force. Right, and so we can sit here and we can wait for our sin to die off. Yeah, but that ain't gonna happen. So let's figure out a way to take it by force, and the best way to take it by force is to be more obedient. And <laughs> in the most old timey way I could say it, you know, as I was taking people through visual visual visualizing this was, you know, whatever you picture God as, however you picture that. Picture him on the throne and then bend the knee, <laughs> like get on your knees before him and vow your loyalty and allegiance to him. And so that was this past Sunday. And uh, the hope was that we would start to really assess and recognize what it is that's that's ruling us throughout our life and then try to do better at that, try to be more obedient to his, um, his laws. And today's questions deal with one particular psalm. <clears throat> um, we've got one. Uh, we got one email in that has many questions in it that we're going to address, and we may or may not get to um, the second email that we're going to go to yep. today, which is uh, more of a general <clears throat> question. Yeah. Shall we? We shall. <laughs> <laughs> shall we, my lord? <laughs> As you wish, Lester. <laughs> oh, no, wait, you're Cecil. <laughs> Can't keep it straight. Yeah. All right. Hey, Jared, Neil, and most importantly, Vinny. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Wow. <laughs> Rachel said to me, I think Jared hates when you do Vinny. <laughs> I don't. She it's... goes, She goes. I can see it. It just makes it's him just... angry. <sighs> hey. <laughs> hey, all right. Stop it. No. Making the emails. Uh, I got kind of a complex question relating to Psalm 137, verse 9, that takes some explaining. Could you too briefly touch on that verse from Psalms, and more importantly, please touch on how the average Christian should approach social media. What are some good benchmarks to know if we can speak on a subject with authority, and how can we seek out training and mentorship if we feel called to starting a social media ministry but don't feel qualified yet? Is it okay to stay silent on subjects we know we aren't knowledgeable in? In a world where owning a cell phone gives you access to the entire planet's ear, how do we make sure we aren't misrepresenting our God or making Christianity look bad due to our poor response to opposition? So there's a lot of questions in here, and this email was a little bit more <clears throat> lengthy, and so we chose to um, kind of edit or piece some of this together, um, mm -hmm. just give you kind of the background, um, but there's quite a bit that this person uh, shares. There's uh, maybe a, a, one more thing that I'll, I'll add in, in this background information. They say as Christians, if we take on the responsibility of sharing the Word of God, we also have to be prepared for people to ask tough questions, take cheap sure. shots, challenge or insult the authority of God, and it's our responsibility to know how to respond. These Christians have an awesome opportunity um, to talk about context, uh, and then they give some examples of that, and then they go on to say, unfortunately, time and time again, the response from these under-equipped and self-appointed amateur pastors running these channels is the same. There's a lot of anger, avoiding questions, blocking people, yelling, and generally doing a poor job of representing our beliefs and theology. Yeah. Uh, and then they go on, so my question is this. And so yeah. um, if you are listening to this, we didn't specifically leave, um, and you wrote this question, we're not specifically leaving anything out because we thought you didn't do a, a great job. Uh, we're just trying to keep this a little bit more concise. <clears throat> so a lot of questions here. Yeah. So I think the best place uh, to start would be with Psalm 137, 9. And I think part of uh, this listener's desire is wrapped up in a world where uh, owning a cell phone gives you access to the entire planet. So how do we make sure we aren't misrepresenting God? So these are great questions. How do we do this online? How do we do this with tough scriptures like Psalm 137, 9? So let me go ahead and just read that particular psalm. I'm going to read the verse, and yep. then I'm going to read the entirety of... Um, the psalm and try to put this in context. So Psalm 137.9 in the ESV English Standard Version says, Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. Now you read that and it's like, Whoa. <laughs> say what? Whoa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So this needs a lot of explaining. And Part of what we're going to do, uh, we're going to talk about Psalms of Pilgrimage this week. Um, and Psalm 120 through Psalm 134 are these uh, Psalms of Pilgrimage. And then 135 and 136 kind of complete um, this uh, additional um, part. And then 137 stands alone. And then uh, 138 
we start at like another category of psalms. So 137 yeah. does stand alone. And what 137 is, is this is a a commentary, if you will, on uh, Judah's Babylonian captivity. So this is speaking about a very specific event. And so what I want to do is go ahead and just read the entirety of this psalm. Verse 1. By the waters of Babylon, there, there we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. Zion here representing Jerusalem. On the willows there we hung up our lyres, for there our captors required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let me let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy, remember, remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, how they said, lay it bare, lay it bare, down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. So now that we've put that in context, it is a little less jarring. Not much. What you've got here is you've got this tribe of Judah that's under Babylonian captivity, the Edomites were at this point allies uh, with the Babylonians, and they come in around uh, 580, 586, 83, somewhere in there, uh, BC, and they overtake J Jerusalem. They destroy Jerusalem, and the Babylonians did this because uh, they were concerned that trade routes were going to be closed off by the Egyptians because Jerusalem at that point was inhabited by a lot of Egyptians. And so this is all money. This is all greed. This is they're going to close our trade routes. So let's go in here and let's overtake and destroy Jerusalem, take this back. And then they took all of these people captive. And so the author of Psalm 137, which we don't know for sure, a lot of theologians believe is Jeremiah, and I'm going to read Jeremiah 51 here in a minute, is going to have a different perspective on this. And if it is Jeremiah or if it isn't Jeremiah, the likelihood that this uh, individual, well, O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall be he who repays you with what you have done to us. Clearly, the Lord had a planned destruction. It had been prophesied for uh, the Babylonians to eventually be destroyed. So I want to go ahead and just leaf over to Jeremiah 51. And the general heading of this entire section of Scripture is called the utter destruction of Babylon. Mm. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will stir up the spirit of a destroyer against Babylon, against the inhabitants of uh, Lebkamai, and I will send to Babylon winnowers, and they shall winnow her, and they shall empty her, Land when they come against her from every side on the day of trouble. Let not the archer bend his bow, and let not him stand up in his armor. Spare not her young men, devout to destruction all her army. They shall fall down, slain in the land of the Chaldeans, and wounded in her streets. For Israel and Judah have not been forsaken by their God, the Lord of hosts. But the land of the Chaldeans is full of guilt against the Holy One of Israel. Flee from the midst of Babylon, let everyone save his life. Be not cut off in her punishment, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance, the repayment he is rendering to her. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand, making all the earth drunken, and the nations drank of her wine. Therefore the nations went mad. Suddenly Babylon has fallen and been broken. Wait for her. Take balm from her pain, for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. We would have healed Babylon, but she was not healed. Forsake her and let us go to each his own country, for her judgment has reached up to heaven and has been lifted up even to the skies. The Lord has brought about our vindication. Come, let us declare in Zion, Jerusalem, the work of our Lord, our God. And then it just keeps going on. Sharpen the arrows. Take up the shields. The Lord stirred up the spirit of kings. Set up the standard of the walls of Babylon. He makes the lightning, uh, you know, for the rain. He brings forth the wind from the storm. Every man is stupid without knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idol. He just continues to go on and kind of prophesy. Verse 24, I'll repay Babylon and all the inhabitants of uh, Chaldea before your very eyes. And he just keeps going and going and going and going. So Jeremiah is prophesying what the Lord has told him yep. that Babylon is done. Babylonians are, they're done. They will be destroyed. And so what you see in Psalm 51, yeah, Psalm 137, based <laughs> on, <laughs> would you like when I spit out that that mistake? <laughs> that was good, Lester. <laughs> Psalm 51, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I like to go James Brown. <laughs> 
That was even that's exactly what the, <laughs> That's exactly what that sounds like. So what you see in Psalm 137 is this, and the, the heading here is, how shall we sing the Lord's song? They are under captivity, and they don't want to be under captivity. They're, they're awaiting, and they're lamenting the destruction of Jerusalem. And so near the end, by the time when you get, O daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. They're saying, blessed be the person who God uses to accomplish his will in the destruction of Babylon. This just happens to be a very descriptive and, uh, you know, way to, to say it and a very jarring way to say it because you hear little ones and you hear your babies. But we have to understand, like we've talked about, you know, we talked about uh, in relationship to Samuel and we talked about, you know, go into the town and kill everyone. You know, the men, the women, the livestock, the children, the babies. That this is tough language for us to understand. This is hard for us to process because we have this idea of innocence in children. And like we've talked about before, that is not true. Children are born in sin, there is still a certain level of innocence. And this is not me advocating for the destruction of children <laughs> yeah, yeah. in any way, but God had a preset plan. He always has a preset plan. This isn't a, react a reactive move by God. This is something that he has planned from the beginning. He's He is proactive. We serve a proactive God, not a reactionary God. And whether or not the language itself sits well within us doesn't really matter. God, because he's sovereign, because he truly has all authority and he owns all things, all power belongs to God and God is all powerful. We talked about that this week. All power belongs to the Lord. He is within his, he's within his rights since everything is his right. He's within his rights to do what he wants. And if he wants to accomplish the destruction of the Babylonian people, including the women and the children for his plans, his purposes, and his glory, he has the right to do that. And so I think what this listener is uh, saying, you know, these verses usually about, uh, well, so there's a growing trend of people. We're, psych we're kind of circling back yeah. and to, to cover some of this. There's a growing trend of people that this person writes, trolling these spaces, invading their live streams, or reaching out to them, pretending to be Christians and asking to have their favorite verse read out loud. And these verses are usually about prostitution, ejaculation, murder, supposed contradictions, and things like that that sound really bad out of context. One popular verse is Psalm 137, happy is the one who seizes your infants and dash them against the rocks. And so that's, you know, a different translation. Yeah. But what that means and what that's talking about is the Judah's Babylonian captivity, God's prophetic yeah. word that, that Babylon will be destroyed, and that whoever God uses to accomplish that work is, is blessed because God is allowing them to be a part of his active will mm -hmm. as it relates to this particular situation. Yes, if you yep. take that out of context, happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes. And what does that mean? That sounds right. that sounds terrible. Yep. Um, but that's, that's the meaning of that. And um, when you recognize that that is, you know, prophetic in nature and that it's very possible that Jeremiah penned these words and then you read Jeremiah 51, you're going, okay. Um, this is something that makes a whole lot of sense. Yep. So that's the first question that they ask. Can you briefly touch on that verse? I hope that was brief enough. Hmm. And more importantly, please touch on how the average Christian should approach social media. That is a gigantic question. Uh, we talked a little bit about social media already today and how I'm famous now you are. because of it. I have a huge fan base. It's true. <laughs> Henry has a fan base. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing. I'm, I'm invisible in that video. Um, Just wait until Lego thing. No, oh, Lego thing's going to be huge. Dude. Yeah. You're going to be famous for that. I got to figure out the casting of that. I don't want to get bogged down in that right now. So <laughs> how do we approach social media? Well, that depends on by what you mean in, in approach it. Uh, should you have social media is where it starts. Yeah. And social media... I, I'm really teetering uh, or, or toying, I should say, with and teetering on the um, having this Grays 2.0 mm -hmm. because I think I think social media is a bit of a gray a gray area, and is it sinful to have social media? The answer is sometimes, sometimes it is, and so you need to figure out should you have social media at all? Yeah. What, what are you using it for? Mm -hmm. 
And if that is rooted in sin, mm -hmm. then that's where it starts. Yeah. How should you uh, approach social media? Stay away from it. If it's causing you to stumble, it's yeah. if it's causing uh, you to sin, rather, if your use of it is causing other people to stumble, yeah. if it is elevating and gratifying, you know, any type of sin, yeah. excuse me, making peace with sin, mm -hmm. then yeah, get rid of it. How you should approach social media, and what I think this person is is talking about is along their major theme of this email is as a Christian, mm -hmm. and they kind of go on to explain some of that um, in relationship to to subjects. Um, they go on to say, what are some good benchmarks to know if you can speak on a subject with authority? If you decide that having social media is something that you can do and honor the Lord, then it's fine. Have at it. You know, I would encourage you to do with that like, like, um, like I do take fasts from it, take breaks from it. Uh, this is a good principle of life period. You know, the body fatigues, it wears out too yeah. much study wears out the bones. So all things are permissible. Not everything is beneficial and going, you know, year round with social media intake is not, it's not helpful. So do a social media fast, if you will. And when I say fast, I'm not talking about just the refrainment, like we've talked about in the past, replace it with something. Yeah. It's not just get off social media, you know, figure out how much time you spend on social media. And there's metrics within the majority of apps to tell you, you were on here for 48 minutes today. Yeah. And so you go, yeah. You know, which, by the way, if that's where you're at, then yeah, <laughs> like you probably do want to dial that back a little bit. Is that James Brown again? <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's a little bit. Of <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're you're gonna want to dial that back a little bit, and then what you do is you take that 48 minutes that you were spending, whether it's answering questions, arguing with people about theology online, looking at burrito recipes, whatever it winds up being, and then you spend that in the Word, you spend that in prayer. Uh, and you make a fruitful, fruitful time of it. Lead your family through a study, whatever it is. You just figure out a way to to honor the Lord in that time. Not that you can't honor the Lord with social media, but it is a little bit tricky, and we'll get into that a little bit. So what are some good benchmarks to know if we can speak on a subject with authority? I don't know if there are certain benchmarks or parameters. Yeah. And, and that's the trick, right? Because you can have uh, somebody that goes to, I don't care what, it, I don't care what it's for. Uh, there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom, yeah. right? Uh, knowledge is the accumulation of information and mm -hmm. wisdom is the application of acquired knowledge. So you can have somebody that goes to school to be an engineer and they're going to be a civil engineer and they're going to learn how to, you know, build buildings and, you know, maybe do roads, a city planner, city manager, whatever it is. And they get great grades mm. and then they get on the job and they just can't seem to, to do it. They, they understood the mechanics, but they couldn't put it into practice. It's like somebody who really knows a bunch of music theory, but can't necessarily play a song or, um, you know, you can play a song, but you don't know much music theory. So it seems because you can play all this crazy stuff that sounds good that you're going to know what you're playing. So I don't know if there's a set benchmark. I don't think that having a degree in something necessarily means that you're an authority in this area. Mm -hmm. I don't think having a job or a title makes you an authority in this area in respects to, um, you know, Christianity and, and topics. I think that what, what can make you an authority in this area is using the only true authority. You gotta use God's words. Yeah. If you want to be authoritative, mm -hmm. and there's a difference between being an authority and being authoritative. If you want your words to be authoritative, uh, then they're gonna be they're gonna need to be probably not your words. And that's a odd thing to say, but this is how I try to preach. I did it on Sunday. Uh, if you don't submit to the king, you won't get in the kingdom. You, you won't be a part of the kingdom. Uh, was was Those were my words. Yep. And then I went, but don't take my word for it. Here's yeah. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And so if you want to, because the Bible is always relevant, not always relatable, and so some of the language in the Bible is not relatable, and so if you want to take a, a biblical topic and put it in modern day language so that it's more easily understood to the masses. You can do that, but then you got to back it up by scripture. So what are some good benchmarks to know if we can speak on a subject with authority, if the Bible speaks on it 
and then you have to back up what you say. Um, you know, we are in and ourselves, we don't really have any authority. We've opened up over the last couple of weeks, this idea of spiritual authority and, and you know, uh, the, somewhat, and I don't want to say the fallacy of it because, you know, it is in Scripture, there's spiritual authority, but you only have authority if people are willing to, to submit to those things of the spirits. They're responding to the spirit's submission of those things. So some good benchmarks would um, on any subject would be, do you know what the Bible says about that? So if somebody's talking about, let's just take all the hot ones, right? Let's let's take a, the, um, you know, the homosexuality debate, abortion, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, baptism, you know, role of uh, women in ministry, role of men in ministry, cohabitation, sex, sex whatever it is, yep. any of the uh, of the hot hot ones. Then you have to, uh, or hop on ones. Then you have to have an understanding of scripture on yep. those things, which leads to the next question: Well, where do you get your interpretation from? And that is, a, I mean, I don't even know where to begin with something like that. You have to vet sources. Yeah, totally. You can't find something that says what you want it to say. It has to be what it really means. And so it's, it, you cross-reference. It's a, it's a bunch of different commentaries. It's a bunch of different, um, I'll say theologians, if you will, uh, perhaps people that have been in ministry or been in that particular field of study for a little bit longer. But the, the benchmark of authority is is God's word. Mm -hmm. That's the benchmark of authority. For you to speak on it with any authority requires you to have God's word behind whatever it is you're trying to assert. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take a break there and get a drink of water. <laughs> <laughs> Go for you it. got any thoughts? Yeah, I, th I think it's a really good question. Um, and it's one that I think we all probably at one time or another have, have thought about of, you know, there's this huge platform, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or now TikTok, all these different places where there's content being created. And, you know, for better or for worse, the reality is, is that there is a lot of content being made without shame that um, targets Christianity, targets, um, you know, these kind of hot button issues, like you said, like verses like this, like people love these, uh, atheists right. love these right. verses, people who... Uh, God are, is love and he kills babies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. um, stuff like that where, you know, there's so much of that going on. Or you have a lot of people who have exited Christianity. You have ex-evangelicals who are putting out all this content talking about what, you know, I just read one for you the other day of, yeah. you know, um, all this stuff where it's basically post-religious, uh, I can't remember, a post... Traumatic re post religious... Post-traumatic religious disorder. disorder, something like that. Post-religious traumatic disorder. That's it. Yeah. It's something like that. And then listen to all these things of like, if you've ever been told these things. And there are a couple things on the list that I was just like, yeah, that's wrong. And then most of the list was literally just the gospel. Like, you can't fix yourself. You need help from outside yourself. Stuff like that. And it's like, if you've been if you've been hurt by words like these, then blah, 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 blah. I can't remember yeah. what it was. But it's just, there's stuff like that. And so part of me um, for a long, long time, and I still, I think, lean this way, says if the world is going to utilize these platforms for evil, there's got to be a way that we can utilize these platforms for good. There's got to be a way. There's got to be a way. And so where I've kind of landed a little bit, and I, you know, I was that dude for a little while that, you know, got wanted to wanted to have some chats with people, wanted to <laughs> respond to some things, you know, years ago. And uh, you know, I realized, you know what, this is like a horrible way to live. Cause I just feel like I'm just constantly like constantly debating something or someone. And this, this just, <laughs> this is no way to live my life. So, um, I really feel like I've come to this place where I really feel comfortable saying like, we can confront ideas, but we have to be really careful about confronting people. Um, and you know, kind of, you know, one of the ways I think about that is, um, you know, in Second Corinthians 10, you know, Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Okay, so we tear down, basically, we confront uh, opinions. We tear down lofty ideas that are against the Lord. But he's saying that's supernatural. That's not, that's not just physical. That's not just our words. So there has to be something there that's supernatural. There has to be a component to it that isn't just us behind a keyboard. So I'm, I, I also go back to Ephesians where it says, you know, 
don't partake in you know, the darkness, but expose it, expose the works of the darkness. So how do we expose them? And so I think there's a way that we can respond to things, but we have to be really thoughtful about it. And I think we confront ideas and that doesn't mean that we can't, you know, if we see someone saying something that's blatantly wrong, we need to think about it. Like, is this, is this, uh, an arena in which it's going to be fruitful for me to say something it's going to be heard. It's going to bear, you know, is it, is it helpful for me to speak to this? One of the things that can be frustrating is if we see something posted, uh, I don't know about you, but there are times that I'll just click on the comments where I see something problematic. I want to see if anyone's responding. I want to see if any response has been given. And so sometimes that can be disheartening because, you know, all you see are responses praising, agreeing it. Yes, this is this is it, that kind of stuff. And so I think there's there might be space to respond factually. But again, I think the vast majority of what we see in scripture is when we confront ideas, we're sitting down in person with someone, we're in relationship with that person, we're maybe a key, a key individual in their life. And so I, I wonder if the, I've thought about this, I wonder if the way to combat, you know, stuff, especially when it comes to online stuff is simply by being faithful to create good content of our own. What if we, what if we put things out that are helpful and it doesn't mean we're necessarily going after people. It doesn't mean we're nef- necessarily, um, you know, attacking people. But I think about that in terms of, you know, videography and stuff is, is huge. I mean, that's a huge uh, format that pe- people are, you know, producing for TikTok, that kind of stuff. And so, I, you know, I've wondered, is that an avenue for producing content that's meaningful for people and kind of confronts those ideas? But again, I just, unless you're in relationship with someone, I don't think you can confront persons per se and, you know, I, I don't know. And and that can even sound really nebulous. Like, well, if you're confronting ideas, technically you're confronting a person. So right. yeah, yeah, it just, it's really hard. And I, yeah. I just feel like it's got to be case by case. And there's maybe some principles that can govern that. But I just, I think we need to be really careful. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What, what do you think about that? Well, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, there is a certain level of, responsibility we have to can, you know, and I, I, you mentioned Ephesians chapter five, um, you know, verse 11 there is take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. But, and that's true, but you go to verse one, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. He's speaking to the church. And so the idea is like you expose these things within the church and the challenge with social media. And we're kind of skipping down to, you know, a, a question, um, here but the challenge with social media is that so often you don't because you don't have a real relationship with that person you you can't and you can identify a a tree by its fruit but not every tree produces just one single fruit Um, they may produce the same kind of fruit but not every apple on an apple tree is bad not every apple on an apple tree is good there are some there are some bad apples and so every person you know I think about some of the things that I thought as a as a younger Christian um, and the views that I took, uh, particularly eschatological views, like end times views, uh, where in my lack of time on earth, time in study, and uh, ability by the Holy Spirit to discern some of these things, I thought some things that were, I think, doctrinally wrong, but I wasn't doing it to be malicious. Right. I wasn't, I just, I didn't know. Yeah. It was uh, in a very, very, very distant way, Jesus on the cross going, forget the front, they don't know what they're doing. I didn't know what I was doing yeah. at that point. And so I, it was out of ignorance, not out of uh, maliciousness yeah. or wanting to incite things. And back when back when I was banging the streets as a young Christian, there was no social media. (laughs) So you didn't have this. Uh, So it's hard for me to speak into some of that, but you don't really know the intent of, of people. And I like your language about confronting ideas and not, and not people. But, but like you said, there's still such a gray area because there's, they're posting your, your, um, you know, offering commentary on their post. It just feels incredibly, incredibly personal. So, my thought is, and I'll read the next question because we'll kind of get into, um, you know, what are the benchmarks of authority? We talked about that, the Bible. How do we seek out training and mentorship if we feel called to starting a social media ministry but don't feel qualified yet? Well, seeking out training and mentorship is no different with a social media ministry than than 
wanting to just grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If if you want to get into that platform, then I suggest you find some people that are doing it well, yeah. um, that are honoring the Lord in that and not getting in the weeds and not getting in the mud with the pigs and not getting in, you know, um, not returning back to the vomit with the dogs <laughs> because it's very easy for people to kind of drag you down oh, sure. into this cycle of unfruitful debating right as opposed to uh truth seeking which well, is well that's the thing is like that, that's why it's so difficult to and you were hitting on this is like you know if you if you happen to know this person's a christian chances are you know you have some sort of relationship with them you probably don't need to talk to them over social media well, you might be able to just talk to them sorry not person. sorry man right go to, go to them privately exactly yeah. but if it if you're sitting on reddit on your and you're on the atheist subreddit expecting to bear fruit and that <laughs> what are you doing like yeah. that's just... and then the idea is oh we're going to be salt we're going to be light but you have to have you have to understand that everyone has limited resources yeah. and if you're going to take your time and energy to evangelize the world yeah. is that the best use of resources so what do we do we just lead, let all these people go uh, i mean to a certain extent yeah i mean yeah. let's keep reading um take no part in unfruitful works of darkness but it, but expose them so you see darkness on social media and you're like okay i want to i want to combat that and then what happens nearly 10 i've yet to hear a testimony where somebody was like so Back in 2012, I was on Facebook and I was posting about, you know, abortion and I was pro-choice. And this guy or this girl posted underneath me this verse. And I read that verse and all of a sudden the floodgates opened. And, I, and I'm not, I know I'm doing this in jest. I've, yeah. I've yet to hear this testimony. I don't, I may, maybe it exists. Sure. Maybe it exists, but what is the rate of return? Yeah. And so allocation of resources is really important. Yeah. You have to do this. That's called stewardship. Yeah. Sure. You only get so much money. You only get so much time. You only get so much talent. What do you do with these things? So if <laughs> this is when I was, uh, you know, working for a gym, I'm like, let's do, let's spend all this money and do a mailer into people's mailboxes. Rate of returns 2%. Yeah. Is there anything else we can do that's better? Uh, than than that, you know, yeah. yeah. Throw a member appreciation day, and then give the members a, a free workout to give to their friends. Mm. Does it cost the gym any extra money? Yep. Now all of a sudden, people are in the gym. You've got face to face contact. Yep. You're building relationships. You can send out the mailer and give the information, yeah. but the rate of return is very low. You're doing the same thing. You're basically mm -hmm. just sending a mailer to some comment section, mm -hmm. and you're hoping that somebody might read it. But the rate of return is going to be one or two percent. Yeah, and so. If you have limited time, resources, money, and you know talent, yeah. which everybody does, then how you know is there a way for you to allocate those in, in a way that's going to be a little bit more yeah. fruitful? That's really good. I, I, you know, we we fail to think about it that way sometimes. Of, you know, you have that limited time, you have limited energy that you can put towards. I mean, essentially, what this is is either you know discipleship directly you know, face-to-face -face with someone or discipleship through apologetics with someone face-to-face -face that doesn't know the Lord yet and you're trying to interact with them. If you take that online, you know, do you have information that's leading you to believe that there's going to be a great return on that? Because based on experience for all of us, that's just not going to bear the kind of fruit that you're wanting it to. And culture corrects these things. I, I want you to think about the last time you got your mail. You know, how much actual junk mail was in there? A lot less than there was 10 yeah, years that's ago true. because companies have realized that it is called <laughs> that we have labeled it junk mail as the consumer we've been like this is junk mail and i want you to think about how many times you you get a single postcard or something in the mail and you look at it and you immediately tear it up right you don't read through it no you don't even really know what it is because well, you, you recognize like is this something that i actually is meaningful to me or is it just all you got to do garbage? is look at it for two seconds yep. and all somebody has to do is look at your post for two seconds mm -hmm. and then just disregard it yeah. it winds up becoming junk mail so companies yeah. have gotten savvy with this uh you know the music industry got savvy with this you know cassette tapes were all the rage and yeah, we're going to talk about They're cassette. not anymore? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we're going to talk about cassette tapes this week yes. <laughs> on Sunday. Love it. But, uh, it, you know, over time, people just stopped using them because something else better came along. And I think what we have bought into as Christians is that technology is all about progression. It's the, it's the addition of 
opportunity. It's the uh, the uh, addition of new ways to communicate and that this is progress. This is progress. Now we have new. Now we can reach everybody. Now we can do that. Yeah. But what it has done is it has caused an unbelievable regress in the amount of true evangelism that takes place. Mm. What we do is we will post something to somebody that we barely have a relationship and we'll, we normally argue secondary issues, very rarely primary issues. Sure. You know, very rarely am I having a conversation with somebody who are like, well, my friend keeps supposing Jesus isn't the son of God. And I want to, you know, share with them how Jesus is the son of the true son of God. Every once in a while you see something that, you know, the Bible isn't real, that kind of stuff. For the most yeah. part, it's the same playlist, it's right? mostly Christian, like, Facebook groups where you're arguing right. about essentials. Right, right, right. You're not arguing essentials. Yeah. You're arguing, which, again, should you even be doing that online? So... Culture's corrected and gone, well, these things aren't fruitful. It, you know, the music industry is correct, and you know, nobody's really using this anymore. And, and when progress started happening with technology, Christianity has bought into it, and so you'll make your post, and you think, well, that's evangelism. Mm. And is it, is it mm, kind, kind of maybe? But it might be an aspect of... It's an aspect. It's one yeah, tiny one component. Yeah. And so... And the thought would be, well, well, then let's do everything. We don't need to eliminate that, but let's do everything. But the problem is, is most people can't do everything. You don't have the time, resources like we've talked about, or you don't have the skill. Yeah. Listen, the bottom line is, is some people aren't good writers. They're not good at writing. Yeah. They're not good at face-to-face. -face. Yeah. They're not good in front of a crowd. Or they're better in front of a crowd. Or they're better one-on-one. -on -one, or they're great writers. So sit back and analyze and go, this is what I'm capable of, or ask somebody you know, love, or trust, hey, here's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Is Do you think this would be fruitful? And if you start to get the endorsement of people you know, love, and trust, people that will actually tell you the truth, yeah. you know, and people you're like, that kind of know what's going on. Right. <laughs> yeah. Then, yeah. then you can start to 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 do that, and I and I know this isn't directly answering the question yet, yeah. but how can we seek out training and mentorship if we feel called to start a social media ministry but don't feel qualified yet? Um, seek out people that are experts in that field, people that you feel are doing it well, yeah. people you know, love or trust, um, that have a good understanding of scripture, and you know, talk to them, flush out a vision. If yeah. you want to start a social media ministry, the first thing I would do is ask yourself why. Yeah. Why? And is this the best use of my resources? Yeah. You know, um, social media is a wonderful thing. It is It is rooted, ooh, I'll be careful with this, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> it's rooted in a bit of laziness mm. because we can just do it from home yeah. and we confuse convenient and lazy. Mm. It's very convenient to do it at home, but it's also somewhat it can be somewhat lazy because we don't take, we don't have to take the extra steps to do that. I'm not accusing this listener oh, or sure. anybody else yeah. that uses social media of being lazy. Yeah. That's not the case at all. I'm just saying we have to examine this. Mm -hmm. Why do we, why do we want to do it this way? Yeah. Is it more convenient? Are we just better at it? Yeah. You know, so examine the motive. And yeah. and do you really want to start a ministry, any ministry, any ministry at all, because you want to see hearts and lives changed? Or are you just a champion of the truth yeah. and you just want people to know the truth? It doesn't really matter to you what they do with it. As long as they recognize it as truth and that they're wrong, then, well, I'm, I'm satisfied. And again, not projecting that on this listener in any way, shape, or form. Um, in fact, I know this listener pretty well. Great individual. and um, But I think that, you know, these are things that people really need to examine is why do I, why do I want to do that? So examining that motive, motive is, I think, absolutely paramount. Yeah. If you examine the motive, then start doing the homework like you would yeah. with anything else. Find people that are skilled in that area, that are successful in that area, hard to measure success in that area. For sure. Think about conversions. Think about testimonies. Yeah. Like if you've got a whole ministry and there's zero testimonies, you need to step back and go, okay, yeah. is, you know, one would think that there would be at least some testimony. Now, I understand mm -hmm. we're called the spread seed and water seed and that God makes it grow. Yeah. I think about that in relationship to what we do. Yeah. You know, I'm. we get a fair amount of feedback just because of the nature of how the church is set up. Mm -hmm. But I imagine that the Lord is doing more than we're aware of sure. based on the fact that we use a lot, we use all of his word here yeah. and... We read a lot of his word here, yeah. and we're explaining his word, and his word never returns void. It's going to produce fruit. Yeah. But 
if you have no stories, if yeah. you've got no test, if, if there seems to be no fruit, yeah. then, you know, maybe don't go to that individual. Yeah. Um, if you're a part of, you know, a church and you have access to, to the pastors there, not that pastors have any, uh, you know, great insight, but sure. the reality is, is they have more time to spend reading the Bible, although it's certainly not accurate that we float around all day reading the Bible. You know, there's certain things that we have to do, but it yeah. is our job, our responsibility to dig for these things. And so yeah. you would hope that your pastor is going to have some insight yeah. uh, that perhaps you don't you don't have. Yeah, um, looking for guidance is yeah. always wise. And then this, uh, but don't feel qualified yet. I heard Rachel shared, she worked with a lady years ago um, that said, you know, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. And I thought that was a cutesy way of, of, of saying it. But what, what I liked about that saying is that none of us are really qualified. Now, yeah, you got qualifications for elders right, right, and right. qualifications for deacons. Yeah. And I get that. And if anybody wants us to unpack those, please send in a question. Um, I'd love to. I'd love to do that. These aren't necessarily, you know, things that we achieve. Yeah. <laughs> these are, these are things that we shoot for and aim for yeah. as as elders, as Christians. Mm-hmm. There's not a thing on that list that a you know uh, a, a non vocational pastor uh, or minister should be doing. But this idea of you don't feel qualified yet, I, I'd be careful about putting too much stock into that feeling. Where is that coming from? Yeah. If a lot of times we don't feel quali- qualified because we don't have um, a, a good understanding of the topics, mm. and that's maybe a good gauge, okay, yeah. get more information, uh, or we can't communicate the topic effectively, well, that's a little bit different. You're going to have to work on that, and the only way to really work on that is real-world scenarios. Right. Uh, People, you know, say, I don't feel comfortable sharing the gospel message. Okay, we'll share your testimony. Yeah. Nobody knows you better than you, and you know your story better than anybody, so share yeah. your story, and that will get easier over time. Don't put too much stock in not feeling qualified. Uh, I've been in full-time ministry uh, for over 12 years, 12 and a half years now, and I've been a lead pastor. It'll be seven years in November. November 22nd will be seven years, and I still don't feel qualified <laughs> in the way that we would feel qualified right. in any other uh, secular vocation, right. you know? Um, yeah. So is it okay to stay silent on subjects we know we aren't knowledgeable in? By by goodness, yes. Please do. <laughs> Please do. Uh, and this is not my opinion. I'm going to read a couple of uh, scriptures here. I think probably the most uh, well-known um, is it a proverb? Ah, well, Cecil, it is. <laughs> Are we Southern? I don't know what. Cecil and Lester and sounds. It sounds a lot like Colonel Sanders. We sound like cowboys. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. I was thinking, that proverb is finger looking good. <sighs> That's what my guy does. That's good. Yeah. I thought he goes, up, ah! <laughs> right. Here's where he is. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's spittoon. <laughs> I don't know what it was. <laughs> I feel like he's just, I don't know. He breathes a lot. Got a of lot of problems. Well, he's around hay a lot, and he's got a yeah. hay allergy. Yeah. Proverbs 10, uh, verse 19. When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Mm. When words are many, another a translation, when words are many, sin is not absent, but he who holds his tongue is wise. Yeah. Uh, I think that's NIV or me smashing together 16 translations. <laughs> it's the most real it's, statement. It's, from, <laughs> I've it's, heard it in that's time NIV, time. NASB. It might be a bit of the message. It's <laughs> me talking about the shark. Right? It's, it's King John, which yeah. is not King James. Yeah. King John. It's King John's version. I, good. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, where well, words are many, sin is not absent, but he holds his tongue is wise. Again, the ESV putting on words are many transgression, right? Sin is not yeah. lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Man, we just got, we need to hold our tongue. Mm-hmm. It's really important for us to hold um, our tongue. The scriptures talk about, uh, you know, Prover- well, 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 let's go to Proverbs 19. Um, I love Proverbs 19. There's so much good stuff in in the Proverbs. You, uh, you love Proverbs 19? I do. I, I really do. Have um, you have you thought about maybe marrying it? Proverbs 19 said no. <laughs> Wrote a song and everything. Wow. 
Proverbs 19. So verse uh, 2. Desire without knowledge is not good. Whoever makes haste with his feet and misses his way. Mm -hmm. That word desire there is more often than not uh, translated zeal. Mm -hmm. Desire, enthusiasm without knowledge is not good. So let's put those two together. Uh, Somebody's talking to you about a subject and you aren't that knowledgeable about it, but you... But what they're saying just feels wrong. Mm. And you're just like, ooh, I think I can fix this with, uh, but I'm not quite sure what to say. I think I think this is what this verse means in context. So you've got the, you've got the enthusiasm, but you don't have the knowledge. So hold your tongue. Hold your tongue because you're going to start. I find that the more you speak, which is odd that we do a two-hour podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Are there a lot of transgressions? <laughs> Oh, an unbelievable amount. Oh, no. <laughs> but a podcast with us holding our lips would not be a podcast. Let's podcast. We uh, yeah, hold it. No. Oh. Hmm. You like hold it like a burger. Hmm. Henry eats his burgers. He 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 opens them up. He goes open face with it, and then he he's he's all about deconstruction of the burger. That sounds like my kids. I said, "Why you what do you do that for? It's meant to be eaten as a whole." And yeah. he looked at me. He goes. Let me do what I want to do. <laughs> did he, he did. He really did. He said, I want to do what I Fantastic. want to do. Yeah. And he said that because I say that. Ah, nice. Because I'm trying to teach him uh, not to boss everybody when he plays. Yeah. Because he's like, you know, let's play chase. You run over here. And then when I say this word, you run after me. And then when you tag me, then you run back over here. And I'll be like, I'm not going to play with you if you don't let me do what I want to do. It's like you guys are huddling and he's giving you a play by. He is. Oh, yeah. Man. He's a bit of a type A. I feel. <laughs> <laughs> Got that from his mother. Which is the biggest lie on the planet. I am the problem. <laughs> I'm the problem here. So holding holding back, yeah. even though we have this enthusiasm and we have this desire to correct what, we th- what we're pretty sure is wrong, but we don't have the knowledge, boy, just stay silent. Mm. Stay silent. Go yeah. back. Go to one of those uh, mentors or people in your life that you know, love, or trust that mm-hmm. you think might have some of that information. And then... Tell them what you're thinking, and then you guys go to the Word together. Or if you're not as knowledgeable and you feel like you can do self-study to get a pretty good handle on what it is they're talking about yeah, uh, or what it is that you want to refute, then go back and do some self-study. But part of the problem, part of the problem is... You know, this person says, so there's a growing trend of people trolling these spaces, invading their streams or reaching out to them, pretending to be Christians and asking their favorite verse and reading out loud and then reading all these, you know, verses that are a little bit uh, odd. But the problem is, is that many, I'm shooting back up a little bit in their yeah. email, but the problem is, is that many of these channels are made and run by people with little to no formal training, whether it's Bible college, seminary, or even just experience leading Bible studies or involving ministries. And so, yeah, exactly what their issue is, is is a- answering this question. Yeah, yeah if they don't have yeah. uh, the training, whatever that training is, man, yeah. I went to Bible college, it was fine, yeah. <laughs> like you went, it was yeah. fine. But there's nothing like on well, the Well, you job got that experience. piece of paper, and now you feel super confident in everything and everything. In all of, things. Yeah. When when my diploma came in the mail, it came you with God's it. phone number. Yeah, and right. now we can text back and forth, and <laughs> I get the insight. Like, that's just not how, yeah. how it works. And so absolutely what the formal training does is it shows a desire, a will, and a work ethic mm. to get that done. But... I mean, I had to take uh, pre, a pre-calculus it, 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 for what, right? You know, I'm, I'm up there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in my uh, minor was in um, management, yeah. local church management, and I've yet to need that level of math in anything. Yeah. And I've done some measuring here, and I've done some budgeting here. But never, yeah. never needed to do uh, that on that level. And so, uh, Western, you know, college, Western education is, it's got its uh, weak points. I'll say, and I'll just leave it at that. Does it? <laughs> it does. <laughs> Keep uh, going, Lester. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, once again, is it okay to stay silent? I wouldn't say it. it it's not just okay. It's biblical. Yeah. Like yeah. If you, zeal without knowledge is not good. Like it's not going to produce anything. Mm-hmm. He holds his tongue as wise. If you want to know the damage that the tongue can do, go read. You know, James, Pastor Bob did a sermon. Um, you know, talking about you know the tongue, um, and so it's 
it's really important that we stay silent because what we do is we start to in hopefully hopefully the motive is good but but even with more of a an innocent and pure motive yeah you're, you're still just setting off a chain reaction of yeah. misinformation that can yeah. wind up just doing so much more damage yeah i would say if you have an overwhelming urge to respond but you know that you do not have the proper understanding to be able to confront that but you do it anyways i would argue that i more than likely your motivation is probably there's something going on you need to ask why you feel such a need and part of that could just be you know we've all felt that like that urgency like oh my goodness someone needs to say something because this is so wrong right um and in social media world as evidenced by my son's super jam um yeah you know that the likes are racking up the views are racking up no one's confronting this what are we gonna do right yeah pray right You can pray. Yeah. You can pray. You can pray for that person. You can just say, Lord, save them, reach them, whatever it is that the Lord wants to do. He's going to do. You know, a lot of the problem I I see with, with, and he kind of raised this, these people that are kind of starting these things and they just don't have a good foundation for doing it. You know, I think there's a lot of excitement around thinking you're going to build something great. There's a lot of excitement around those things and there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the time, maybe sometimes there's just, you know, I, I saw this podcast with this guy who's really smart. He does this stuff. It's really cool. I want to do that. You know, it's just like, well, what's the motivation there? Is it because you want to be cool? Is it because you want to build something and feel like you're an authority? Is it because you want that feeling of people listen to me and people care what I think about? Um, you know, I just, I just wonder, you know, we are quick to want to do stuff like that, but then there's people in our life that we haven't sat down and talked to. Right. There's people immediately close to us and this thought is well this is the the the, a bit of the laziness and sure and that word i know is not going to sit well um with us but you know there's a bit of laziness with that and there's a bit of insecurity and fear which is why we're behind a computer or a cell phone it feels a little bit safer doesn't it 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 does because we don't we don't we're not going to see a face we're not going to feel this rejected and People will post and then people will post horrible things oh, back. Sure. And, you know, I've had, I haven't had it happen to me. I've had people post things about sermons before. I, I've never, yeah. I've never gotten in the weeds on social media. Yeah. I've just never done it. I've never, I've never commented on a post in, in a way that, you know, other than sweet guitar lick, you know, <laughs> something like someone's that. like, you're a stupid Christian. And you're like, whoa, how did, well, <laughs> I don't want to debate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was literally on, on social media publicly during COVID publicly equated to a Nazi. And I read that comment, you know, uh, you're, uh, using Romans 13, like the Nazis used it. Oh, so no. putting me in the same sentence with a Nazi, certainly the same thing. And I didn't take the post down from the yeah. church. Like it is what it is. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm fine. Yeah. In, in but I'm not gonna respond. Like yeah. I just, I just don't get get in the weeds on those things. But it yeah. is. You're right. You got people in your backyard, people in your family, more than yes. likely that that might need these. Things. Or, or you have people at church that you know are. We've talked about this. They're they're doing something. They're in sin. You know that you're. Right. You need to be confronting them. That, right. Like that's where you could be putting your energy. That's where. You know, you're called immediately and you're not doing that, but you want to go online where it's maybe less, less relationally risky. Yeah. You know, where it's like, you know, what are the stakes there? This person you've never met in your life, if they don't like what you have to say, whatever. Yeah. But this person that lives right next to you and you want to talk to them about Jesus and they reject you. That hurts, right? And that's awkward. And like, well, now I have to look at them and I know that they think I'm stupid or whatever it is, you know, there's. Now I want to yeah. be. I do want to be careful with that word "lazy" because, yep. like we talked about earlier, everybody only has so much, so much, so much right. as far as resources go. And you right. may not be a person that feels like you can talk to somebody face to face. Yeah. And it it that's you know the Lord has wired us all differently. Sure. Yeah. And so all I'm all I am um, saying would would be helpful is for someone to really examine their motives and go. Yeah. If I don't have the ability or I find that I get clammed up and I just get, you know, I feel a, a bit of social anxiety in, in face-to-face situations, then 
then yeah, go the yeah. social media route, be responsible with it. There is a way to to do it. It's going to take some time and you're going to have to maverick some of it in a yeah. sense because there's not a lot of, it's not happening well. Yeah, It's a matter of time before people are like, I'm going to start this thing with good intentions. And then somebody's like, your post is dumb. And they're like, you're dumb. Yeah. You know, and it's well, at least I'm not going to hell. <laughs> right. It's something, it's something like that. Yeah. And so I, again, I want to make sure that we hear that word lazy, because mm -hmm. if you are a person that has that ability and you just don't want to take the time to do it because it's more convenient for you to do it at home, uh, it would require sacrifice from your Netflix time mm -hmm. or even sacrifice from your family. Yeah. And, I, and I want to be careful with that. But there is a certain level of, I mean, Jesus is who are my mother, who are my brothers? Like, yeah. you know, you it's going to cause, you know, separation and sacrifices, you know, doing yeah. something until you feel it. And so really examining motive. But if you are a person that gets maybe that social anxiety or feels some of that hesitation mm -hmm. in, then great. You're aware you don't have to go out there and do it. There is another way that you can can do that. Yeah. Uh, just make sure that you do it responsibly. Yeah. Their, their last question, you know, in a world where owning a cell phone gives you access to the entire planet's here, how do we make sure we aren't misrepresenting our God or making Christianity look bad due to our poor responses to opposition? I'd say a couple of things here, reiterating. Um, you're going to misrepresent God if you misrepresent his word. Yeah. So knowing knowing the word um, the world does need to slow down. It's really tough with social media because it, we do feel this sense of pressure that the mm -hmm. post comes and you know that, you know, a thousand people, 5,000 people, 10 people are going to see it. They're going to respond and there's going to yeah. be all these things, but understand that the Lord is aware of all of that and that it's more important, uh, that we are obedient mm -hmm. to, to him and take the time to do the homework, um, whatever that homework is. And, I'll, I'll kind of wrap this up with something that I've said uh, from, uh, you know, the pulpit several times, which is, you know, you see something or even if you don't see anything, because there is that. And, and we've kind of in jest tongue in cheek, you know, poked at this a little bit where you got your coffee and your Bibles laid out and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, because social media can be a, it's not just again, uh, reactionary things that are misrepresenting uh, yeah. God and, and responses to opposition, but even what we believe is our righteous pursuit mm. of, you know, well, I'm, I'm showing people that I'm reading the Bible and I'm hoping it'll encourage them. We'll really examine that, that motive. So whether you're responding to opposition that you've done research on, you've checked the word of the Lord, you've maybe talked to a few people in, mm -hmm. in you know, gauged is this, is this responsible? Is it is it right? Is it necessary? You've yeah. asked all those questions, and that, then the very last thing you do is you pray before you post. Yeah, pray before you post, and the prayer is simple: God, should I post this? And if you are in step with the Spirit, you go on. You you keep on reading in Galatians. You keep on reading in Ephesians, and I say, walk by the light, right? You know when we read Ephesians chapter five, be be in the light. Uh, walk in the Spirit is what Paul tells us in in Galatians. Therefore, I tell you, do not take part in unfruitful works of darkness, uh, but expose them, for it is shameful, as is Ephesians 5, to even speak of these things that do not... Um, that they do in secret, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time. Here's the stewardship, making the best use of time, because the days are evil. And so this idea of walking in the light and walking in the spirit is walking in step with the spirit and if you're truly walking in step with the spirit when you take that five seconds all right lord i've done all the work should i post this mm -hmm. you will get a sense one way or the other one way or the other and the hope is that that sin nature is not taken over but again if you're walking in the spirit and you're walking in the light then the lord honors that we talked about it on sunday which which one of you is going to give your son a snake if he asks yeah. for a loaf of bread how much more will the father not give you the holy spirit to those yeah. who ask and that's talking about it's not talking about more of your spirit more of your presence it's talking about you know i want a relationship with jesus christ i submit to you father give me your spirit when he does that he gives you he gives you all the spirit and that spirit will give you an indication by that peace that is talked about Philippians 4 
or that tension that is talked about in Romans 7 of doing something that I shouldn't do. Yeah. You know, I can feel, he can feel that, that tension for sure. Yeah. And so when you pray, just, you know, wait, see, see how you feel, and yeah. then understand that if you've done everything you've done with the purest moment possible and it doesn't produce any fruit, does that mean that you necessarily missed something? No, but even if you did, there's grace. Yeah. There's mercy. And if you feel called to start some type of social media ministry, all you can do is is give it the old college try and yeah. you know, look for people uh in that field. Uh and then also, I guess the last thing I'll say, you know, pray before you post, but part of that investigation that I didn't mention is is try to figure out if this is a primary issue or a secondary issue. What are you really arguing? Because the the issue of a person that says that, um, you know, abortion is okay and homosexuality is okay and getting drunk is okay and lying on your tax is okay. A, a person that's saying that is not rooted and grounded in the truth of God's word. And if yeah. not rooted and grounded in the truth of God's word, they're not submitting to the king, which means they're not a part of the kingdom. So don't argue the secondary issue of trying to convince them that they shouldn't cheat on their taxes. Yeah. They need Jesus Christ. That's That's who they need. So if you're going to Steward your time. Make the most of the time you have because the days are fleeting. Spend your time trying to to do that. Yeah. But yeah, pray pray before you post. That's good. P B Y P. <laughs> what is this a yogurt place? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Was that T C Y T C B Y T C B Y? The country's <laughs> best yogurt. <laughs> Finger licking yeah. good. <laughs> pray before you post. P B Y P Y P. Well, why Y P? P peanut butter. Yogurt, peanuts, <laughs> peanut butter, <laughs> yoga, yoga poses, yoga poses. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Sounds weird. Peanut butter. I can't get off peanut butter. Yeah, I know. You really love that. Are I you do. hungry? Uh, I actually am a little bit. Yeah. Did yeah. you have your? Um, I did. Chicken and rice. So mo- I am hungry most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. That's the price you pay to play the game. <laughs> I suppose. Nice. Yeah. But this, these were wonderful questions. Thank you yeah. so much to this listener for taking all the time um, yeah. to flush all this out um, yeah. in their mind and then put it in order. Again, I apologize if you're listening that we didn't read things in the exact order, but I wanted to keep bouncing back to certain things. Yeah. Um, but these are wonderful questions. And, yeah, good uh, and thoughtful. And very relevant. And again, yeah, like everything we talk through is just talking it through. It's not to, you know, say this is a bad idea or no, whatever. But no, no, we shape or form. Let's think about all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's really I think good. that's good. So. You never asked me what I had on my walls as a kid. Well, that's all the time we have today, so. If you'd like to submit a question to the body. Is it Van Halen? At one point, yeah. Yeah. Van what, Halen. what else did you have on your walls? Posters. Uh, Michael Jordan for a while. Oh, yeah. When I was a kid. Uh, yeah. The one where he was jumping from the foul line, tongue out. I would just stare at that and be like, that's how. <laughs> that's how. That's He's all fly. I would say. Two words. Yeah. That's how. <laughs> <laughs> Lego thing. Lego thing. <laughs> what else was on your walls? Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh, well, yeah, of course. There was this, uh, I got a muscle and fitness. I still have the muscle and fitness. It's from like the 90s or something like that. You could probably sell that for like 20 cents. Well, I would never sell it. Um, <laughs> but it was this poster of him. He's got done working out. And he's just standing. Obviously, he's got a shirt off. He's yeah. just gigantic. Yeah. And so I put that on my wall so that every morning when I woke up, that was the first thing I saw. Yeah. And that's what motivated me to work out as a young man. Because yeah. um, I thought, I can do that Yeah, naturally. Well, that's actually my New Year <laughs> resolution is to look like that. So you think I could do that, right? No. Oh, okay. No. Well, you're just a, this, you're just a hater. I, no, I need to, I'm a realist. I need to get the toxic people out of my life. I'm cutting you off. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I've got other people that can host the podcast. <laughs> Where's Mark? Mark! <laughs> um, no, it, it, there's this uh, uh, interview with this old, uh, you know, our old Arnold Schwarzenegger interview. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he's just massive at the time. And the interviewer's like, you know, you know, what do you say to people that, you know, look at your body and they're like, you know, that's just, that's just too much. It's too big. Uh, it's disgusting. I would never want to look like that. Arnold looks at him and goes, I would tell them, don't worry, you won't. And I thought, that's incredible. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's the answer. thing is, and he's admitted to steroid use. You, sure. you can't get that big without BEDs. Yeah. Um, but uh, Schwarzenegger, Michael Jordan, uh, Van Halen mm-hmm. uh, for, um, you know, a lot of stuff, uh, you know, 5150 stuff. And then uh, when I moved out on my own, I put 
nothing on my walls mm. for a while. I didn't want to hang anything on the walls. Um, yeah, you're an adult, you know, at that point. Yeah. But I, you know, wall art, painting, all that kind yeah, of stuff. Sure. And then, and then Rachel and I, you know, got married, moved into the, uh, you know, the condo. Mm-hmm. We really just put some stuff on the walls. So my mom had given us all this. I, I guess it's just called wall art. It was like metal wall art. It wound up being very, um, I, don't, I don't know, it was like a, almost like an Asian inspired type of uh, decor. Yeah. I don't know if that's the right term. There's a lot of um, good feng shui. East, Eastern yeah. uh, type of uh, decor. Yeah. And then we moved into, you know, we had a kid and moved in the house that we have now. And we put nothing on the walls because he's nuts and uh, he's high energy. Yeah, he's high and, energy. And so, you know, he kicks a ball and it hits every wall in my house. Yeah. It's like pinball in my house. And so, but when he turned four, you know, that kind of settled down a little bit. And so I'm like, we're going to put some stuff on the walls. And Rachel and I went to at home and just mm-hmm. bought some stuff and nice. put it on the wall. And uh, we had just the best time doing it. We yeah. don't know what we're doing and we, we don't really like that kind of stuff, but it was a lot of fun. That's awesome. But yeah, it was the sports and the, the sports, the Schwartz, and Nager, <laughs> and then the uh, the old Van Halen. I remember my dad was furious when I put Van Halen poster on. The oh wall. yeah, yeah. Not because of Eddie Van Halen, but because of the level, uh, the amount of Scotch tape I used. Oof. He's yeah. like, "You gonna rip my paint off the wall?" Yeah. And I did. Oh no. Big time. Do you ever do like the sticky tack on like the glow in the dark stars and like that kind of stuff? Rachel had the glow in the stark, glow in the stark, <laughs> glow dark. in the stark gars, <laughs> glow in the stark gars. <laughs> uh, the glow in the dark stars on her ceiling when yeah. I first met her. Yeah. And Rachel's eight years younger than I am, and Rachel was eighteen. Yeah. And I was twenty six, and yeah. I went in her room, and I'm like, "This is a ch- you're like a like, child." Yeah. I, I was like, yeah, "I got to get out of here." <laughs> <laughs> like, Get me out of here. Do you know anything? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Like, do you have a checking account? No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but oh boy. yeah, she she took those off along with all the NSYNC posters. Oh. Yeah. Nice. Just put them under her bed. Wow. They've been with us for 17 years now. Still under the bed? Still under the bed. Wow. Yeah. But up, up, up. I hear that every time Still I lay down. I'm whispering in your That's ear. It. Night. Yeah. Is All right. Talking? <laughs> well, let's wrap it up. Yeah. Thanks for uh, the questions today. And thank you for listening. If you have questions of your own, you can submit those by email to podcast at hopechristianchurch.com or you can text them to 440. Oh, go thing. <laughs> you want to leave that or cut it? Well, we're going to leave it. <laughs> Can't cut that. I know what the title of this podcast is going to be. It has to be Lego. <laughs> Lego thing. <laughs> Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. I'm nervous you saw that on your wall. <laughs> what Lego thing? That's called a hallucination. <laughs> Lego thing. <laughs> Do you see him too? <laughs> Goodbye. 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 <laughs>